Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Thursday, September 3rd edition of Maximum Growth Live. I am your host, Jay Ruane. I'm the owner of Ruane Attorneys here in Connecticut uh, and the CEO of FirmFlex. And my friend over here uh, is Seth Price, managing partner of Price Benowitz in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area and CEO of Blue Shark. And we are Maximum Growth Live. As you know, uh, if you're with us today, Maximum Growth Live is a weekly live Facebook show where we dive into all things relevant into growing your firm at scale. Uh, Maximum Growth Live is sponsored by Maximum Lawyer Media uh, and the Maximum Lawyer family. And I said, I want to start this week by asking you, what did you do to grow your firm this week? You know, one of the things that I have felt like is we are about to come out of summer, COVID summer. And in the guild this week, they asked, what is, what's the one thing you're doing? And I got to say, I felt weird. I felt guilty because I didn't have one thing. To me, it was getting everything firing on all cylinders. We're no longer during the summer. We know what the new normal is. We're playing in it. It's, it's good. It's bad. It's, it is. And the idea that we have intake firing on all cylinders, we have marketing following, following on cylinders. The attorneys are now understand the obstacles they have and what they're doing. And that as we look at numbers for September, October, November, assuming that something miraculous doesn't happen, we now have a set of rules we're playing with. And I feel like our responsibility is to sort of move out of what we did during panic beginning, but now say, hey, for the foreseeable future, this is our normal and we need to play with that set of rules. Yeah, I think a lot of people have been waiting for it to just sort of bounce back to the way it was. Uh, and I, I don't think you can predict that. So I think you got to deal with this is the new world. This is what I'm dealing with. And you got to move on from there. One thing I did this week to grow my firm, and this is interesting, and I actually got the idea from something that we're about to talk about is that um, I got an email shortly after I ordered my Peloton bike, uh, and it actually had me give a, a sliding scale and some feedback to them about the purchase portion of their process. Uh, and so I got the email. And I said, you know what? I've never really surveyed my clientele about, uh, you know, I ask them, where did you find us? I ask them that type of thing, but I never really engage with them that early on in sort of like the NPS one to 10 scale, or how did my intake and, and client care team do? So this week I actually scripted it out, added it to my, uh, my, uh, my onboarding campaign, where six hours after we open the file, they're gonna get a survey asking them, how did our intake and, and client care team treat you during the intake process? And I think this is gonna help us give some feedback. And I modeled it on my Peloton bike, Seth, you have that picture for me of you Absolutely. on that bike? All right, Absolutely. we're going to flash it up on the screen right now so people can see it. But this is Seth on his Peloton. <laughs> so uh, I think it's it's great. I can't wait to get mine. And then we'll have to have a, uh, a Maximum Growth Live uh, event where everyone that's in our audience that has a Peloton, we can all do a ride together. I think it'll be a lot of fun. But, no, but keeping it real, like I'll, I'll tell you that with, with, with those surveys, I've been working on rolling that out for our firm for months and it's just, you know, it's glitchy. It's not there. It's days away. It's been days away for several weeks. And that's part of, that's part of like running and growing a law firm is that as, especially at scale, as you use more complicated softwares, some of the things that sound like they're really easy, what they do is genius. Half the time when you finish, you know, at a restaurant and you get a survey, they don't care about what you're saying. They just want to get you you know, to remember them for a future, not for the first survey, but at the end, they're always looking to say, hey, remember me as a referral source, get a review out of it. And so the idea that they're already, Peloton is already, they do an amazing job. Their, their process is insane, but that the idea that they are already building their raving fans from that first moment is just remarkable. Yeah. And you got to do that as well. You know, this is a, you know, we, we are all customer service firms, firms, uh, and we just sell different types of legal services, but we are in the customer service business uh, selling legal services. And I think that's the way people uh, should approach it. But we've got a great show today. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff on the back end of the show uh, where we're going to talk about some stuff that's coming up. So you definitely want to stick around and watch the whole show because there's some cool stuff that we're going to talk about at the end. Uh, but first, um, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, who's coming on the show today. So Seth, why don't you tell us a little bit about our guest? Uh, and so we'll be uh, so our our viewers will know what what's in store. Well, Ken Hardison is one of the sort of 
premier law firm consultants. He, he's built Pilma, which is an organization that started with personal injury firms. Is He's pivoting beyond that now. But the idea is this is a guy, he's a lawyer by training. He built a firm, sold it, built a firm, sold it, who has really been very instrumental in helping lawyers figure out through masterminds, through annual summits, through his organization to figure out best practices and work on everything that's what we what, what drives me, the non- courtroom, the non-practice of law. So let, let's bring Ken in and, and get him going. Yeah. So give me a second. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, set it up so that we can get him in here. You'll hear a couple words from our sponsors. And when we come back, we'll have Ken Hardison of Pilma with us. Uh, so just give us a few seconds and we'll be right back with you. Thanks folks. <laughs> Thrilled to have Ken here today. Ken Hardison, friend, mentor to many of us. Ken not only built not one, but two law firms selling each of those and created Pilma, uh, a, an organization that has historically focused on personal injury lawyers. I think it's pivoting beyond now, but the idea being focused on management and marketing of law firms and something that I've found a home at. So welcome, Ken. Thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, we, we Jay and I have spent uh, the last several weeks talking to people, not only about what's going on during COVID, but how they can sort of deal with their law firm as a business. And the thing that we keep hearing are pivots that people are trying to take and things they can do to be creative during this time. And Jay was just talking before we came on about how you've been particularly creative with Pilma and how you've adjusted during this uh, unusual time. You want to share with our audience a little bit about what you've done and how you've done it? Yeah. So, you know, one day we were right when it happened, we were, we were promoting our big event. We have a big annual event in June down in New Orleans. And we were just setting record goals. I mean, this was going to be a big, well, I expected five, 600 lawyers. And when this happened, we just said, you know, this is not time to be selling. Uh, this is a time to be given. So what we, what we, we kind of surveyed our members and found out what they were needing. And so what we, we created this whole uh, COVID resources center, uh, how to survive, you know, and so we had, we would do a weekly webinar. We would put articles on there, anything I found. They didn't even have to do with lawyers, but if it was about going remote, how to manage remote pe people, you know, uh, the PPP loans, the PPP, you know, everything that was going on uh, about what you, what you could do, what you couldn't do, then what we had to deal when they were coming back, what you needed to do, what you didn't need to do. Um, and, and we just pretty much gave it away and uh, tried to just kind of be a resource. And then with my masterminds, you know, we usually meet live three times a year. So we had to pivot and do them on Zoom. And then what we did, too, because we saw that here was the big deal. Everybody was rattled and scared and didn't know what to do. And like some of them do a pull out by mark because we have some members that do a lot of spend six figures a month on marketing. We got some that spend, you know, five thousand dollars too. But the deal is they didn't know whether to back off, whether to double up, and everybody was kind of, you know, and so we started doing weekly Zoom meetings. And that seemed to be 
And we did them for like, I guess, 12 weeks. I kept doing them until there was hardly nobody showing up and everybody was getting back. And I said, you know, I thought it would probably just last eight weeks, but it lasted about 12 weeks. And um, so we did all those things. We uh, canceled our event. We put on a, a virtual internet domination boot camp uh, back in May. Uh, we give a big discount to that because we felt like, you know, giving back and it didn't cost that much to put it on. And then we're doing this new event in October, uh, uh, a law firm growth maximizer. Uh, you grow your law firm.com if you're interested. Grow your law, grow your firm.com, excuse me, grow your firm, F I R M dot com. But, uh, Doing those things, and then another thing I did was I got on the phone and called. I, I, I called. I think I'm gonna say I talked to, but I called every member in Pillman. It took me about two and a half, three months, and just checked on them to see how we're doing and see if there's anything I could do for them personally uh, or professionally. Uh, and Ken, and, and my, what, what are you seeing as you make those calls and you're speaking to everybody? That's what I think. One of the great things about what you do is you sort of have your you, you, you see into all these different firms. What have you seen generally for the firms that are excelling during this time? And what, what are you, gen, and what are you seeing for the firms that are struggling, calling, saying, hey, I need help? Can you see any things that may be takeaways for people here of what the firms are doing right and what people are doing wrong? Well, I think what I've seen is that the smart law firms – didn't go in and just fire everybody or lay everybody off. They, they tried to hold on to their good people. Um, and uh, they did start working remotely. And they started, uh, the ones that are doing successful with it are the ones that have a lot of communication. Uh, and, and that's at least once and not twice a day. And it's funny, I've been running film up remotely for three years. So we've been having, we call, call a daily huddle every day every day uh, lasted about seven to 12 minutes. Uh, and then we have a weekly meeting that lasts about an hour. And then we have a monthly meeting that lasts about three or four hours. And so nothing really changed for film itself, but I got the, the law firms to, to buy into this, the ones that I could. And the ones that did, they seemed like they were doing a lot better. And then the, what I saw is that they were monitoring but not really spying on their employees. And some of them were actually doing better, and then some of them were doing worse. And I think the ones that had kids at home that were small or whatever were bothering them, I think they had a problem, and they can't help that. So what they did, though, they tried, to, when, the, when things started lighting up, they started bringing in the people that weren't doing as good at home. You know, and then they left the ones that, because they wanted the space. They, they needed the space distance, the six-foot distance stuff in their offices so they had they couldn't bring everybody back um uh, and i think all of them looked uh you know looked at their marketing and and, and it depended on where you were at and what your, your theory was uh we, we had a lot of smart ones that were doing tv that were able to negotiate and get uh twice as much tv or twice as much radio for the same price uh had some that even got billboard companies to give them extra three or four months on their contract. You know, uh, we had some that were negotiating their leases, getting some kind of, uh, you know, deal on that. They were getting PPP loans. Uh, and then uh, they were, I got them to call their clients. I mean, I had one lawyer, I said, just call your clients. So they were getting people in their office to call them. I had one lawyer that called and picked up like six new cases in one week, just by calling his old clients or his, his present clients uh, and just check it on them. And then some of them went further and sent letters out to all their present clients and old clients, let them know they're here for them. And they, he picked up like 20 some cases wow. just because people, you know, what is it? They know you, you, you care. Um, so that were the smart ones. I think that did that. And uh yeah, I think that was like that was that was some of the main major things. I mean, you know, and um, well, you know, Ken, one of the things that we get asked a lot is, you know, sh you know, people sort of say, hey, I see this much revenue coming for this practice group, and people come to Jay and say, hey, I'm thinking about pivoting into another practice area. Um, Want to get your thoughts? I remember I went to an early Pilma, 
and realized about a third of the room was doing SSDI. And I was like, I got to go do it. And I built the website, did it. I realized it wasn't for me. In my, in my market, my, I didn't know what I didn't know, but the cost structure in an urban environment is not a good place to be, in my opinion, for an SSDI practice where you want lowest labor, lowest rent. What are your thoughts on when people come to you and say, hey, I want to expand my pie? What, you know, what, what, what type of advice do you have for somebody? Yeah. Well, well see, this is a book. I think you can expand it, but don't go into a whole different practice area. Just kind of uh, niche out in some of the other areas in your area. Like, like if you're a domestic lawyer uh, and you just do general, maybe you want to really, because this is going on, really push some content out there about domestic violence. You know what I'm saying? That shit's going on, right? It, it goes up when people stay with it, right? Uh, you know, if you're a criminal lawyer, do expungements. I mean, that's something that people... You know, uh, if you're a PI lawyer, uh, you know, not as many cars on the road, so they weren't as many cars. That was the big deal for the PI lawyers. Uh, they were they were actually making money, but they won't get the cases, and they're going to feel it eight months from now, you know, maybe five months from now. But, uh, you know, go into stuff. Look at dog bite cases. Look at uh, swimming pool cases. You know, look at... Uh, Motorcycle cases, because those guys are gonna ride. They don't give a shit what's going on, right? Uh, you know, so so go to niche out in the area that you're already in, but but to but to turn into like I'm gonna go into bankruptcy because the economy's going bad. You know, you you're gonna do that. You better go buy a law firm because to get up to speed, it's just gonna be too much. Now, if you could go buy a bankruptcy law firm. And you got the money, you can get a good deal. Maybe not a bad idea, but I don't know if anybody's going to want to sell right now because they know the money's coming, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, so it's always what supply and demand. But, but uh, you know, that, I, I've been preaching that. In fact, I got a call yesterday. I got a, I got a firm that's trying to break into a new market and they're having problems. And uh, so what they're going to do is they're going to try to buy, buy a law firm that's already got a good name there and uh, you know absorb them. And I think they'll actually save money in the long run. Uh, and the other deal is, think about it. I'm a baby boomer. All the baby boomers, you know, that's the last big deal. Our lawyers are getting into retirement age. And some of them, uh, maybe not all want to retire, but they sure as hell don't have the headaches and BS of running a law office. You know what I'm saying? And a great opportunity for some a lot of lawyers out there by the law firms make the person off council, use their goodwill, do a transit, transition that the guy that's, or the girl that's leaving, they make money, you make money, everybody. You know, used to, when I first started, when a lawyer, uh, he just died and his practice just died with him. I mean, there was no, I mean, that's just the way it happened. Uh, things have changed so much. I mean, so much now that uh, they're, they're there's actually businesses out there that do nothing but broker law firms now. I mean, it's a big, it's becoming a big business. I think it'll be more too. And as you know, the next five, seven years, I think you, I, I brokered one already this year back in, well, we did the deal last year, but we didn't, didn't close it till February of this year, right before the COVID. <laughs> but, but he's doing good. He's actually doing good. Uh, I'm still working with him. You know, I helped him buy, I, I didn't help him with the money, but I helped him negotiate the deal and, you know, uh, get go to some sources of money, financing that was not crazy, you know, not having to pay 20% interest, which is like from some of these hedge funds, like they like to do. Got him something more around 6 7%. Awesome. Jay? Can I, I actually have a question about that. You know, as someone who's been in the uh, position to sell your uh, prior firms, uh, and also assist lawyers with purchasing a firm. What are some of the things that a lawyer who's thinking about getting into that purchasing of a firm to take over their business and expand that way? What are the things, what are like the top three things that a lawyer should be looking for when they are approached with the opportunity to buy a firm? Is it, you know, current caseload? Is it, uh, you know, what is it? Is it projected revenue? What are the things that at first, uh, you know, you say, uh, these are the things we need to know. And when you were positioning yourself to sell your firm, what did you do to make your firm attractive to an outside buyer? The number one thing, and, and most lawyers don't believe me, 
the number one thing I want is to have a list. <laughs> I've seen I've seen corporations pay millions of dollars for other corporations just to get their list and then close the company there. If you've got a list, a mailing list, a current mailing list of all your prior clients, email list, whether or not they're contacting them or not, if they, you know, that is worth its weight in gold, in, in my opinion, because that, you could take everything from me and just leave me my list, and I could have another firm up and going and, and flourishing within six months, I promise you. Uh, and I could do it very pretty cheaply, too, with just emails and direct mails and stuff like that. But that would be the number one deal. The, the number two deal would be uh, I want to know what their reputation in the community is. And, you know, I, I would uh, talk to other lawyers and then I would also go look at their Google Plus reviews. I mean, that's going to tell you most of what you need to know. Uh, and then I, I want to know what is, why are they wanting to sell? You know, uh, is there something there, I, you know, is there something there I need to know about? Um, is this guy get ready to get it done after child pornography? You know what I'm saying? And just willing, to, you know. And I don't want to buy a firm like that because then that's going to taint, you know. Sure. I might so, buy his list, but I don't want to buy the firm. Well, uh, Ken, I've been down this road a few times, um, you know, on smaller scale acquiring. But one of the things I've seen is I've tried to get bigger and buy a regional player in a geography just beyond mine has been unless somebody is sort of literally you get them at the moment before they're about to collapse and, and pass away, you very often get unrealistic expectations of what the firm is worth. And, oh, yeah. I, and it, you know, I find that I end up myself with the opportunities. I wish, I wish I could say that I've been more successful with this of people who are literally on the way out, bloated overhead that you're not going to be able to maintain files that are a mess and that you end up with a huge headache. I, I really aspire to be at the other end where it's a viable firm before the baby boomer, you know, while they're still around with what no, the rest of business does like a three to five year buyout. That's how the real world works, the lawyer world. And given what's going on in Utah and Arizona, who knows, maybe we're going to see more of this in legal soon, but it, do you have any thoughts on how to get the timing so that you're not knocking on doors where like, yeah, sure, I'll sell it to you for a price that's silly versus getting something where it's defunct. And while you might get a de decent deal, you're going to pay in sweat equity, cleaning up the mess. Well, what I do for lawyers, and I've done this, we are getting ready to do it again, is I'll find out what community, what area, geographic area they want, and then what kind of practice they want. And I just do a mass mailing, maybe about three of them in a row over three months and say, listen, you know, uh, and I do different angles on it. You know, when I'm, you're tired of the headaches, whatever, you know, you have an exit strategy, da, da, da. And uh, find somebody that wants to sell. Don't try to talk somebody into selling that don't want to, but just give them these things about, you know, what are you going to do, da, da, da. Maybe there's a way I can, maybe I can help you, hook you up with somebody that can take these worries off of you to let you do what you want to do. Still make some money because, you know, protect your family, your estate, things like that. But but you're right. I mean, uh, one I did, not the last one, but the one before, like two years ago, uh, we, we I had to go through, I had to kiss a lot of toes to <laughs> find the prince uh, because everybody thought, it's like when you sell a house, you always think it's worth more than it friggin's worth because it's your house. My car, my house, it's worth, you know what I mean? You know, you know uh, even more, I would argue it's even more so than the house because it's yeah, your yeah. baby and whether or not the revenue is irrelevant. It's your people. It's this whole thing that, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with, you know, numbers. And, uh, you know, again, given that there's that window where you need the motivated seller, clearly as we're both saying, you need somebody who's motivated to sell. Yeah but not so motivated that there's nothing left. Um, I have a particular deal on the table right now on the immigration side, and the group has wound the firm down so much that while the pricing is fine, the lifting, the labor, the mental anguish for myself and staff would be so much that I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah, and that's what you got. I mean, yeah, you got to look at that too. That's like I say, why are they wanting to sell? I mean, you know. They already wound it down. I mean, you ain't got much to sell, really. Although I tell you, I, I did this back. This is years ago. This is back in the in the eighties, man. I, older older lawyers there in, in my 
County, when they died, I'd go to their spouse and try and, and buy their phone numbers and give them like $500. And, and, and you know, what, what do you want to buy? Said, well, you know, it's a popular number or whatever. But no, I want it because these old clients are still going to call him. You know, and I said, well, no, this is law offices, but that's not him. He's, he's deceased, but what can I help you with? I did like four or five of those in the 80s. Uh, this older lawyers there died in town. And uh, people thought I was crazy, but I mean, it, I thought it was a, I thought it was a smart deal. deal. I don't know. But, no, you know, no, I, I agree. I've tried 2.0 of that was buying the URLs for those yeah. guys that had it. Uh, it didn't have, I don't think it was quite as successful generally. Um in the sense that the number was still coming, the the older guys with URLs, they the, the sites didn't have that much traffic, and there wasn't yeah. that much there. But as we now are looking at boomers, they've had sites for a decade, and as Jay knows on the marketing side, those crusty old domains, you can't, you know, yeah. you put one of those out. We we're just joking the other day, a domain that I planted years ago and haven't done anything to in years. I'm driving to the beach and I tested my search on the way there. And all of a sudden a site I hadn't touched in 10 years was top of the SERPs. Um, you know, it was like, uh, it's time to dust this one off. So when you can get those again, uh, to the analogy to phone numbers can, can be very valuable. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think Absolutely. there's something to be said for, you know, putting up a three page site now that you're going to harvest yeah. in, in a decade. Uh, and, yeah. and you know, get, get your ideas flowing. Ken, you brought up something, and I and I want to touch on it before we get too far off of it. And you talked about if I had to start from scratch with a list, you know, in six months I could be profitable. And as we see some lawyers trying to pivot or people who are striking out on their own, I think that's something that 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 you can provide some insight to. What? How long should it take for a practice to become profitable? Because so many people think, hey, I'm going to hang a shingle and at the end of the first month, I'm going to have money in my pocket. Um, but you've seen a lot of these firms. Yeah. What do you think is a reasonable amount of time uh, to get a firm from zero to, OK, we actually have something here? It depends on what type of practice. Okay. So, like, you know, let me give you one extreme to the other. Uh, one of my mastermind members, she got in uh, veterans disability. She lost $2 million before she started getting profitable. Wow. It took her four years, but now she's killing it. Seven years in it, she's killing it. I'm telling you, killing it. But now that was, most lawyers couldn't hang, you know what I'm saying? She had a very profitable social security practice to hang on to. Now, social security practice is going to take about three years. Because the cases take two years, you know, 18 months, two years, and you got the deal. PI practice will take about, you know, a couple of years. Uh, and, and frankly, it depends how you account for it, right? Well, if, we're, if we're not in the legal space, you open a business, you, you capitalize it with X amount. You know, if you're saying, you know, your SSDI case is coming a couple of years later, your PI case is coming a couple of years later, you still have all that expense for those two years that yeah. those first few cases are not making you profitable. Yeah. Day one, they may be profitable in that month, but you know yeah. the question is how how well are you capitalizing what you're doing, and are you realistic for what the the horizon is to get to true profitability? Yeah, and that, that's that's something that, and I and I, I actually preach this now, uh, probably more than I did ten years ago. Uh, you have got to have, most businesses fail because of lack lack of capitalization. All kind of businesses, you know, they go within five years. Uh, you know, uh, Barn Harness is uh, revenue is for vanity, profit is for sanity, but cash is king. If you don't have the cash, you know, and anybody that knows, I've been through it, where you 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 you're making money and you're having to pay taxes, but you ain't got no damn money. It's phantom income, and I, I went through that. And let me tell you, it's not fun when you've got to write a check for three or four hundred thousand dollars. And you only probably drew out cash one hundred twenty thousand. That's tough. You know what I mean? Because you're having to pay these loan backs. You know, and like you say, you had to have that money up front, right? It's got to catch up, so you got to pay it back. You know, but you're still making profit on the books, but you're not. You know, it's just it's a tough circle. Um, but yeah. But it, I mean, you know, so it, it takes a while. That's why I, I, I like the idea of maybe if I was going to go to a new practice area, maybe trying to buy for, I, I think it's a lot easier. Uh, 
but you got to be careful. You can't overpay, and you and you got to make you got you know make sure they got those things to list and why they're selling it and who it is you're buying it from and why they're selling it and all those things. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it, I think it's quicker to profits than just starting from scratch. Um, I love that. Idea. You know, I, I started a social security practice from scratch after I sold my first firm just to prove that I could build a firm off of $6,000 a month marketing. And I did. I had like 700 cases in like two years, uh, spending no more than $6,000 a month on marketing. Uh, Impressive. I, yeah, but it was a, a lot of work too. And I did a lot of grassroots stuff. But my, my deal was, you know, I sold it in two years, but it still wasn't even profitable. I mean, I made my profit by selling it because I really hadn't started making money. I was losing money, you know. I mean, I, I had lost money in the first two years. Uh, but I still made money, I thought, because I sold it. Now, I made the decision that that the, the margins were so thin that I was going to have to, instead of having 700 cases, I was going to need 4,000 cases. And I just didn't want the headaches of all those people. Because uh, Social Security is very intense on labor yep. for staff, not lawyers, but staff. Uh, and I just didn't want the headaches, you know. Uh, so I sold it. But but somebody like criminal, you get paid up front. I think the, the road to there is a lot quicker than it would be like for a PI or disability or somebody that's on a contingency. Uh, you know, if flat fee is going to get profitable quicker than anything else. But it depends on what your average fee is, too. You know, that's that's the uh, that's the big deal. I mean, for the most part, lawyers don't charge enough, uh, just to be honest with you. And they're scared and, and they're scared that they're going to lose the clients and they don't charge enough. And, and the truth is. It's like I had this lawyer ask me at one of our events one year. She says, uh, I'm a domestic lawyer. And she says, I'm working, you know, 60 hours a week. She says, I'm making good money, but I'm just a frazzled. She says, I'm just, you know, I'm dead. She said, what can I do? I said, uh, how much you charge hours? She said, $300. And go to 600 She said, well, I'll lose half my clients. I said, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I said, you'll work 30 hours and make just as much. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's not a, look, your, your point's well taken, whether it's an exact one, but I, I'm a big believer in that. The idea that if the rate is higher, you're perceived by the community differently. We early on on our criminal practice, as we moved into white collar and the higher end federal, you would lose people if you didn't have a higher number. But the number you're pegged at, if somebody's getting divorced and they see a $300 an hour number, that pegs you as a lawyer. It shouldn't, but it does. And then if you say I am a five or six hundred dollar an hour lawyer, look, realistically, you may have a sliding scale. Say, oh, military discount, that's three hundred. You know, you know, uh, destitute mom, you know, we, we can you can get your pricing so it's not that much different, but you're not going to get the higher end cases. You know, as I built out my firm with all the lawyers, I've always had like a high end criminal lawyer and then a lower end person who could do the cases where there's less funds. And below so, that, you know, Seth Price. Who doesn't exactly. really go to court. <laughs> so so the idea being that as you do that, when you're talking to that solo, Ken, the idea is almost like you have to wear two hats because yeah. what that person's doing is they're only getting the junior money. They're not taking advantage of the fact that they also, assuming that they have that that's experience in gravitas, that they could be that senior person at the higher level getting that in. You know, again, they could say, I'm only there. But the idea that if you are one person, you don't have associates yet, the idea that you have to play both ends of it to be yeah. uh, to be viable or to be most profitable, I should say. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. So, Ken, tell us a little bit about your October event, because I know uh, some of the people who are watching might be interested in that. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's something, uh, you know, with COVID, we had to kind of pivot again. And so I'm doing something that I've never done. I... Uh, I'm going to do an event that's three days, like from 11 o'clock Eastern to 5 o'clock Eastern, like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But I think it's the 15th. I can't remember. It's like October 15th, 16th, 17th, I think. And it's really going to be me. Uh, probably 90% of it is me. Uh, and I've never done this before. Usually in big events we have three or four days, I might speak twice. Uh, and um, I just think, you know, whether I'm right or wrong, 
I think that the uh, people need me more now than ever, to be honest with you. Uh, and so I'm going to share some stuff I've never shared before other than with people that pay me like $1,500 an hour for one-on-one -on -one consultation. But I feel like it's time to uh, help help the lawyers out there. And uh, so I'm only charging like four ninety seven If you're a member of Pilm, it's two ninety seven. I mean, that's nothing. And, and I give 100% money-back guarantee because – you know, my deal is if you don't think it's helping you, I don't deserve your money, right? I mean, I don't. I, I enjoy I, what I do, and if I'm never, nobody's ever going to say that I took your money and, and ran. I mean, because I just give you your damn money back. I don't need it. Not that bad. You know what I mean? I, I it's can't. Like, I, I do. I was. I went to your first event over a decade ago, and I remember seeing that offer. I'm like, oh, if he's willing to make that offer. Um, you know, I'm in and over the years, have, have you actually more than a hand, more than two or three people ever come up to you for that? Zero. Zero. Zero in 11 years. But I expect it any day. You know, I expect the next one. And you'd be somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Right. You know, you'd be happy to do it. I try to think of it that way. I wish we could a hundred percent be this way with clients. Jay, I don't know if you're the same way, but if you have a traffic matter. Somebody's like, I don't think this was right. You know, you did the work, you've earned it. But if somebody's really not happy, you know, and you know, make that person happy. I got to tell you, that happened to me uh, three weeks ago. We had that hurricane here, knocked out power. I had a client who, against my advice, opted to start a hearing before I could get to internet access. Uh, and they went through the hearing. They got denied on their expungement, which is what they wanted. He called me up. He said, I I'd, like, I I'd like half my money back. I said, you're getting 100% refund. I'm sorry that that happened, but it, it is what it is. You went forward against my advice. I'm just going to refund you. Go with God. Have a nice day. Uh, and he actually wrote a nice review saying if things didn't go well. And I really respect this man's integrity for just giving me all my money back when he definitely did a lot of work for me. So I think that helps people long term to think of it as you're not serving just as one client. You're serving your entire career. Uh, and we're in this business for decades. Uh, you know what you're doing in 2020 uh, can also impact you in 2040, you know, so. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's what it's all about, man. I, I, I really believe that marketing, as we know it, is in a process of changing uh, online and offline. I think it really is. Uh, when all my brethren boomers are gone, I think you're going to see something completely different than what you see now. It's going to be really on trust based relationship marketing. I think it's going to be so much more about that than it is about being on the first page of Google or, or you know, or being on TV or being on radio. I really believe that the really successful lawyers are going to be the ones that really, their damn past clients are marketing for them. I, I really believe that. Now, I might be wrong. But you, I know, really you, you, you say that now, and last week we had Peter Shankman, uh, and he talked all about it's a customer service economy. And that's really uh, where things are at. So it's, it's interesting, you know, two people who haven't heard each other speak are talking about the exact same thing. Seth? No, I just, uh, look, I appreciate it, Ken. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done for both myself and for the industry. Uh, we we'll lo love having you here and hope to hope to have you back soon. But uh, thank you for making the time today. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate Thanks, it. Ken. Take it easy. Thanks. We'll see you in October. Okay, bro. Don't be good. Thank you. Bye. In this world today, if you want to grow your business, you want to grow your firm, you want to take on more cases and make a bigger impact, you have to have a digital blueprint. Statistically, throughout the time that we've been working with Blue Shark Digital, our law firm, the Atlanta Divorce Law Group, grew over 1,400%. They truly understand where we're headed and how we want to get there. I have a team in Blue Shark Digital that I feel like has my back. All right, Seth. So let's talk about this because it came up during the interview with Ken. Uh, I made a little bit of a joke, but it's something that I think, you know, hits is, is sort of a, a gut punch. Right. And it's it's that you're not in court every day like some of the lawyers in your firm. So let's talk about that. Right. And so, so from my point of view, I look at it as a superpower. We had Peter Shankman on talking about ADHD as a superpower. So to me, the idea that I've divided and conquered with somebody who loves to be in court 
where I was good in court. I was six and zero in my legal career, but <laughs> you know, but in, in my courtroom career, but that. I feel that I have the ability to focus on things that we all speak about. The whole show is about, you know, growth and, and marketing and operations and the idea that you can sort of try to do both. And it, it's funny, I think the ADHD is kicking in, but there've been a lot of articles written and stories about women. Can they have it all? Can you raise kids and have a full-time career? And there was a very controversial column in the post saying you really can't. You can't be at the top of your career and also fully be there for your kids along the way. Again, that's that's one sort of side piece that is out there. I'm sure there are examples that that counter it, but these were very accomplished people who said you really can't can't do both. I believe at some level it is very hard to do both at a law firm. That if you yeah. want to be, you know, David is, you know, in court teaching at Harvard Law, you know, taking on cases. He just got that that the case of um, the uh, person who was supposedly doing espionage for Russia while within the military. I mean, like you can't be the A plus level practitioner and also take care of everything else unless you take certain steps or something's going to give. So to me, the fact that I have not put myself, I'm guessing like a John Morgan is not in court on a day-to-day -day basis. And you had sort of had a pop culture reference talking about the fact that this is not new. This is something back in the eighties people were talking about. Yeah, it was, you know, it, it's, it's the, I used to watch LA law, you know, when I was a kid, 13, 14 years old. And there was a scene where all the guys and, and, and the women in the boardroom were making fun of Douglas Brackman saying, you know, you're not a lawyer. You know, you just run this place, but you don't do what we do. And, you know, he actually had a very unique approach to a case that they wound up adopting and it won the case. And he was like, look, I am a lawyer. I, I only do this so that you can do your job. I don't want to be doing this. This isn't what I signed up to do. I didn't go to law school to do this. And it's interesting because, you know, it's something that we've talked about a bunch of times. You know, we see a lot of law firms grow and they sort of hit a wall. Right. And now. I'm looking at my own firm. I'm sure you've done some introspection to look at your own firm. And we've been able to grow because of who we are, because of my fascination with systems, because of the, the things that I put into place, but the things, you, the way you aggressively go at markets and that type of thing. And I wonder if there are people who are watching this who are thinking, I just want to be a lawyer. I don't want, I like, I like the idea of growth. But I like the idea of being a lawyer more. Uh, and for me, I, you know, I'd love to get back to actually doing some legal stuff, but I can't do that in my firm because I'm the only one who can do what I can do. You know, and, and we've talked can't... about that. I've, I've pushed you over the years saying, you know, you're ne there's you're not going to bring somebody in who's as good as you on, on the lawyering side. You know, I'm going to go to court. You're going to pick up cases. And all that's fair. But the question is you can only do so much so well and right. you know what is that what can you not outsource but what can you add to you know i think one of the things i'm most proud of is early on at max law when i was on an early um max law episode with jim and tyson uh somebody listened dane, dane phillips and he's like he heard what we were doing he's like i want to be part of this and the idea was it was exactly what you're talking about. He loved going to court, but he didn't want to run a firm. He was sort of ready to be out on his own. And so to me, it is that segmentation where you can allow people to do what you want. And look, it's fraught with peril because let's say you say, I just want to be uh, I just want to be in, in court and you find a local person who happens to want the opposite. The odds of a business marriage working, probably not unlike a personal marriage. You know, there's yeah. a very large failure rate. So again, what I've loved about Price Benno is the fact that we've been able to bring people on and work them into our system so they could have their own practice within our practice to actually practice and have intake and marketing and, and, and ops and everything else taken care of for them. The thing that I, I sort of look at is as we talk to our many of our listeners who are like, hey, how do I find that missing piece? You got to do one of two things. You either have to go out and buy it and hire somebody to do it. Or, and that may not be cost effective, or you got to bring somebody in with equity who's going to balance you out and pick your poison, right? You're, you know, while, while you're, you know, you have the lion's share of what, what the profitability of your firm is, but you have a lot on your shoulders. Um, and the question is what's right. It, you have to figure out what's right for you. And history is written by the victor. If you find the right partner, 
friend of mine locally with a, a large uh, digital creative agency rolled up into a larger agency. He went from like two people to a hundred employees to a huge roll up that will probably go public. And the idea is he found the right partners along the way and history will be told by that. How many people do we know that partner with somebody? It's a disaster and it sets them back years. So yeah. if, if, if you can either hire the right person or if, if, if you can partner with the right person and create something bigger, either is a great path. The question is, can you find something that actually will get there versus the rose colored glasses and the wish? And then you find out the reality after the honeymoon that you really don't have what's needed or it's not a synergistic or friendly situation. Yeah. What I find is a lot of times uh, you find solos who wind up partnering up with another lawyer and they partner up with that lawyer thinking, wow, this means that I'm not the one on calls on Saturday and Sunday anymore, or there's going to be somebody else for me to, you know, uh, to worry about splitting that rent with. Uh, and what they really are getting is another person and all of their problems that now they have to solve. So your problems go for 100% yours to now 100% yours and 50% of somebody else's. Uh, so you're really only adding work to yourself by adding uh, a partner to the mix sometimes if it's not done with the right sort of introspection and vision. And this goes back to stuff that we've talked about in the past. And it really is, what is your vision for how you want to practice law that should be your overarching decision? Um, you know, there are a lot of law firms that have grown and scaled because that is the vision of the partners who are making those decisions. Uh, but there are simply some that decide to stay and, and maybe they add one or two associates, maybe they add more staff, but they don't want to necessarily get large to 40 lawyers, 60 lawyers, 100 lawyers and staff because that's just not part of their vision. And they've made those concrete steps. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm happy where I'm at. I may, you know, I may add one or two staff. I may, I may add one or two lawyers, may subtract one or two lawyers, but I think I've decided to, I, I'm maxed out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nearing 50. I don't want, I don't want to have to put in the effort to get, to get huge. I just don't think it's for me. Um, and, uh, and, and it's taken a long time to come to that decision. Uh, so I've grown, but I think I'm going to cap my own growth. Uh, maybe not necessarily in profitability, but in size. That's the way I'm looking at it. Um, well, if, I know you got would, some if, if Vegas would take odds on it, I, I'd probably bet against it. But you know, <laughs> meaning that, 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 that we may not see the last of uh, Ruane Attorneys and its uh, expansion. But it's another thing. I would say I'm along sell the price Benowitz when they want to get into Connecticut. That's what I'll do. Uh, you can buy my firm. We'll end up with uh, PB and R. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so we, you know, when you, one of the things you mentioned is people look at business partners, because that's, a, it could be a topic for an entire show is how do you find a business partner, right? And a lot of life, a lot of business life, I relate back to dating. I'm probably get myself sued at some point because I use it with employees, whether it's recruiting, it's the same dating, whether it's clients on intake, it's, you know, it's all about that dating dance. And I feel that very often when I look at how people choose to be law partners, you see really dysfunctional uh, courtship going on where you know somebody, but it's sort of like being friends with somebody and then deciding to get married and not having those tough decisions, whether in the personal side, it might be what religion are you? Are your, Can I live with your, are your in-laws going to drive me so crazy it's going to end the marriage? Do we want to have kids? How many, like all those decisions. And I see those hard questions that really need to be asked along the lines of what you were just talking about, which is what do you want? It, you know, are you interested in doing working in this part of it? Is it actually synergistic or is it two people talking about what they want? So two things happen. You get into the marriage. Let's assume that it's good for a moment. But two things happen. One is what people say they want isn't always what they want which sucks. It's true in the personal side. It's true. You know, of every profile, uh, that when I, when I dated people love their family and love to travel and you find out that they can't stand their family and hate, hate leaving their home, you know, that what people say is not necessarily the, the, actually what they believe, but secondly, people change so that you're in this marriage now with somebody and things happen. Their marriage breaks up. There's a substance abuse issue. Their marriage, uh, their their marriage is good, and their family grows, and they want more time at home. All of those things are such variables, and that not that look. If you thought about it too much, you'd never do anything. But 
thinking about it smartly, knowing all of those variables and asking at least the threshold first questions, Jay, that you referred to a moment ago, so that you have an idea, are we both getting something that complements each other versus two people that want to be the front man, and you hear this a lot, who don't want to practice and want to focus on marketing. If you have two people that are aspiring to do the same thing, you're no better off than you were before. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I, I get into this uh, debate sometimes with my wife, uh, and she's going to hate the fact that I'm going to bring it up. But, you know, she has a tendency to try to maintain relationships for, you know, 20, 30 years. And I said, you know, some of those relationships, you you became friends with those people merely because you lived in close proximity to them, not necessarily because you had a lot in common with them. Uh, and so you now that you're older and wiser and you're, I don't want to say set in your ways, but you've sort of decided certain things about your life. Those friends may not necessarily be true friends anymore um, if they ever truly were. Um, and that's something that I think you got to look into. You know, it's nice when you're undergoing the shelling of the daily practice of law, when you're being fired upon to have somebody else in the foxhole with you. It's a whole nother thing that when the shelling is done, you know, is this somebody that you can actually spend some time with and build something with. And I think that's something that uh, we got to keep talking about because we want to remind people that that's something that they have to talk about. Yeah. But once again, Seth, we are, we're, we're going to be over time. If, if you didn't know um, that it happens a, a, almost every week, except for when we have Shankman who goes a million miles an hour, but we're, we're going to be over time uh, for sure. Um, so you want to leave it with this. I got a couple things to talk about. Um, first off, if you want to take this on the go, you can subscribe to our podcast. It's available on all of the podcasting platforms, uh, or you can get us through the Maximum Lawyer podcast. As you know, we are sponsored by Maximum Lawyer Media, uh, as well as my firm, FirmFlex, and Seth's firm's uh, Blue Shark. Um, but we have been working on a bunch of things uh, for you guys in the coming weeks, and I think it's going to be some cool stuff. Uh, so we've got uh, a new segment that's going to air next week, uh, let's book it with Ryan McKean. Seth, you know Ryan. Uh, so tell me what you think he's going to bring to the next year. Well, look, what we're trying to do is, A, have some fun, and B, bring as much value as possible. So Ryan is just a, a great, innovative attorney who is also bridging the gap between amazing practitioner and creatively running a firm and building it out. Uh, it's just awesome to watch in action. And the idea that he's going to do something, which I, I, have a, I am dying for, which is, to basically do a deep dive on a book a week. I don't always have time to read all of those books, but I'd love to sort of be inspired, get enough takeaways from him, figure out which ones I want to spend my time on uh, you know, reading fully. But I uh, can't wait to have Ryan uh, and create different segments. So let us know what it is you're interested in. And if there's a, a particular book you want Ryan to uh, to focus on or something that a topic for the show, uh, bring it to us. But uh, I'll Definitely. leave you, Jay, with this. Um, you know, I'm closer to your to your wife in the sense of I hold on to people for many, many years. Uh, but it is interesting that while I do it for myself, when I'm out there and I see over the COVID period and you watch people's social interactions from a distance, you do see it's fascinating when you do see relationships that are out there, easier to see in others than in yourself, that are really dysfunctional, but have just stood the test of time. And it's, it's a, and it, the analogy can be brought to the business world. It's, it's not dissimilar. There are relationships in the business world that are, you know, that were served a purpose for a long period of time, but have sort of outlived that. And you have that loyalty piece. You're not going to give up true friends over that. But very often, as I think you were alluding to, where, where the friendship really has devolved and it's really just an obligation, it's a much tougher, tougher uh, thing and maybe a, a future discussion for us here. Yeah, I think that'd be a great thing to talk about. And the other thing, uh, before we go, we are bringing back our hot seats. We've done some a couple of weeks ago. And uh, if you're interested in being in a hot seat, you know, let us know down below in the comments because we'd love to have you talk through your growth problems, see what we can do to help you out. We'll bring you on a show uh, and we'll give you some unbiased free advice uh, and see if we can help you get to the next level because that's what we're here all about at Maximum Growth Live. So with that, we're going to end this show this week. I am Jay Ruane. He is Seth Price over there. Thank you so much for being with us, and we'll see you again next Thursday on another edition of Maximum Growth Live. Bye for now.